Hello folks and welcome back to English 403-503 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be going over this uh, article, wonderful article by Rachel Donegan, The Rhetorical Possibilities of Accessibility. And we're talking here about uh, readers who may not have the same uh, vision, the same hearing, uh, the same mobility, and so on and so forth that uh, you might enjoy. Uh, so how can we make our documents in such a way where everybody can use them, find them useful? Uh, everyone can enjoy them. Everyone can access them. Uh, and the gist of the article is it's not just for... Um, you, you, you want to do this not just because it's the right thing <laughs> in general, uh, but there's also a kind of a side effect or sub-benefit, if you will, and, then, and that's that it makes you a better writer. It kind of feeds back. So you're, you're putting some good out. You're trying to do good in the world, but the good is coming back to help you. Uh, so I love that... Uh, the packaging here. Uh, but specifically, we'll be talking about alt text, headings and styles, and then some uh, presentation scripts. Now, first off, she talks about uh, screen readers and low vision readers. Now, so what these are, uh, you might have uh, some experience with, say, audiobooks, but most of those are actually recorded by a professional narrator. <laughs> Uh, so that's not really what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about software that digitally, synthetically, uh, automatically, whatever uh, word you want to use there, tries to read prose, uh, tries to figure out what's on the page and read it. Uh, and you might have uh, heard some of these. Some are better than others, but you know the technology has come a long ways. And people that have, uh, you know, people that use this kind of software on a daily basis, they're really, really good at it. Uh, you know, if we sat down with this JAWS, for example, and tried to uh, have it read to us, uh, it'd probably be very difficult to use, maybe slow, um, maybe sort of cumbersome for us. Uh, but that's just because we're not trained on it. Uh, you know, again, I've worked plenty of students that use this stuff regularly, <laughs> regularly, and it's amazing. <laughs> uh, but even still, as impressive as that is, uh, it, it struggles with images and graphs, uh, you know, any sort of visual thing. Uh, you know, it's good at reading the text, but, you know, if it comes across an image, it might just say image or blank. Uh, and that's a problem because you really, again, you want the readers, whether they can, whether they're using a screen reader or not, you want them to be able to uh, get the full benefits of, the, of that writing. <laughs> you don't want to leave anybody out, obviously. Uh, so how can you, uh, you know, how can you address the situation? How can you uh, make it so that if you want to use a photo, you're not leaving people out or you're not, you know, removing part of the message uh, from people that are using a, a screen reader or a, you know, the low vision readers. Uh, so she uh, gives an example here, which I think is very effective, of a photo of a state seal. Not uh, the animal, but the uh, seal of uh, Georgia here. So you can see there's a photograph of the state of Georgia seal. Uh, that I'm showing here. <laughs> well, but the question you want to ask yourself is, what if you couldn't see that? And what if you were relying on some, you know, some writing, basically, to describe what was in that image and why it was important enough to be in the document? You know, what's it doing here? What role is it serving? What kind of meaning does it have? Uh, so I need to know that, even though I can't see the photo, uh, so that I can understand, you know, the, the message you're trying to convey. What are you trying to communicate by inserting this photo? Um, so that's the, uh, uh, you know, the writing prompt, I guess, you know, for this. So she offers an example of how she would describe this. And she says uh, above here that the original one was just a picture of the state seal of Georgia, or just state seal, state seal of Georgia. And that was the original caption. Uh, but she argued that's not, there's not really enough information there. You know, it really still doesn't really tell you what it looks like or what's on it. Uh, so she recommends going into more detail. She says, this is her example, figure one. A picture of the seal of the state of Georgia, dated 1776, engraved into stone. The description on the seal has three columns labeled wisdom, justice, and moderation, with a semicircle labeled constitution con connecting the three. Photo by Gary Lee Todd. So there's our Creative Commons uh, licensing information from a previous lesson. Uh, all right, so that, uh, even if you couldn't see that image, 
if you read that or you were read uh, by the screen reader all that detail, you would get a pretty good idea. Okay, now I can, you know, now I get it why that image is in there, or at least I know what <laughs> you know what people are seeing. Uh, so that is the the goal here, and she's got some tips I want to cover before we do the exercise. Uh, so the first tip is, is of course, you, you want to be thinking about the context of this photo. Maybe, maybe you're, the whole essay is about state seals, and you've already somewhere in the paragraph above this described all this information about the, the columns and the words on it. So you don't have to rehash that. <laughs> There's no need to repeat it in the caption. You've already talked about it in the main part of the text. Uh, so there, you know, maybe it would be sufficient just to say a photo of the state seal of Georgia engraved in stone. You wouldn't need to repeat all that other information because it was already in the in the paragraph. Um, on the other hand, if you didn't do that, then you would need that caption. Uh, keep your caption short is the second tip, which I think this is solid gold here. You know, so if you do find you're having to write four or five lines to try to describe that image, uh, maybe that's a sign that you really haven't integrated that image very well into your text. You're kind of making it do too much work, basically. Uh, so that'd be a good point to go back, look at the paragraphs around it again, see if you can expand those so that uh, uh, you don't have to provide so much detail in the caption. Uh, it's pretty good advice, too. And then finally, she says, if it's just for decoration, you know, if it's some little filigree type thing, squiggly lines, whatever, in the corner, just to make it look nice, <laughs> it doesn't actually have any meaning to it, uh, then you could just put decorative image. Uh, so let's flip over to... Uh, here's WordPress. I'll show you how to do this. So let's uh, go to Add Media. And this will plunk us into the media library. You can grab uh, a little image here. Let's choose this uh, Husky's flag, lovely little flag here. So the alt text that it recommends is just Husky's flag. And let's say this is an article where we really haven't talked about any, we haven't described the flag in the text anywhere. Uh, so what would we need to put here in the alt text and the caption so that you'd be able to, um, you know, uh, get the full benefit, I guess, of this image, even if you couldn't see it. In other words, how can you describe <laughs> what we're looking at there? Let me make it like this so you can see a little bit better. Uh, so just in the box, you know, imagine you're writing one of those uh, captions, the alt text that she's, she's talking about in the article. Now, what all would you need to say about this image? Yeah, so that somebody who couldn't see it uh, would still be able to, you know, get all the relevant details. All right, so back to this. Uh, now she's talking about headings and styles. You know, these are things I love to do. Um, she's really right that if you... Uh, if you think about a document as just sort of one giant thing with no subsections, uh, you know, you, you tend to make something really kind of rough and hard to read. It lacks coherence. Basically, it's, it's kind of rough draft writing. <laughs> you know, it's a lot better if you can think about your document as having different sections to it and uh, a logical progression of ideas from topic to topic, you know, as you're going along. And one of the best ways to do that is just to use... Uh, these headings and styles that she's talking about here. Now she says it's uh, <clears throat> it's really useful again for people using screen readers um, because they don't want to have to read the whole document every time uh, that they just want to get to one little section. <clears throat> I mean, imagine how annoying that would be. <laughs> you know, if every time you're like, oh, turn to page 12 and you got to like actually read through 12 pages uh, to get to page 12 instead of just skipping to it. It's basically uh, the, uh, the problem we're trying to solve here. <laughs> uh, so instead of just the one big, you know, mass of text, you're trying to think about how to uh, make it into uh, smaller sections you know, using headings and styles. So let's take a look at her tips on this, and then I'll again show you how to do it in WordPress. Uh, so she says, uh, don't do it until the end. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Remember, uh, especially the first draft, I mean, you really don't even know what you're going to say yet most of the time. You're just kind of thinking as you're writing trying to get down on get it down on paper and then you want to take that revise edit and then at that point you start making starts to make sense about how you want to uh, uh, section this stuff off uh, how you want the whole big picture document to flow uh, now she says that you should wait till the end every time I don't know I kind of go back and forth I think it's useful to have a, 
a little bit of a plan at the beginning too, uh, but your mileage may vary, right? Just try it out, see what works for you. Uh, two, keep your fonts and emphasis simple. Uh, update heading to match current selection. Right, so actually I had a whole summer job doing this one time. I'll, I'll tell you that story some other time. <laughs> now, a lot of people don't realize this. <clears throat> If you use these uh, headers and uh, the styles, basically, uh, it doesn't really matter what it looks like as you're drafting it because at any point you could change it and then it'll automatically go through and change all of the headings uh, within one fell swoop. And that's how those themes work. If you ever played around with those in Microsoft Word, so it's very useful and it saves you a lot of time. So basically, what you don't want to do is say this was section one here. You wouldn't want to go in manually and like say, okay, I want that bold, I want to make the font bigger, make it italics, make it red, and, you know, and do it that way. Uh, that's the inefficient way to do it because now you got to do that every time you want to make a section. Uh, it's far better to use this uh, styles tool up here. See the little carrot in the corner? It says paragraph. You can open that up and just put heading one, and now you've got your official heading there you can say introduce the topic blah 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 and then when you're ready for your first section you just come up here again to heading one or if you wanted to maybe have this in subsections i mean i wouldn't get too complicated with it folks <laughs> you know it's, it's not very good to go beyond like a couple of levels here uh generally speaking but so let's just stick with the heading one blogging for fun and profit you know let's say we had that and then maybe another section there somewhere called uh blogging for educational purposes you get the idea right uh, so again the benefit of this even if you don't really like the way that that looks it's relatively easy to change them all you know again one fell swoop I don't give me one second here and I'll show you that all right so it's a little bit technical uh, to do the uh, styles <laughs> <laughs> uh, within uh, WordPress, I'll go ahead and show you anyway, just in case you're, you're curious how you how you would do that. But uh, the trick is basically the same as with Microsoft Word and, and Principle or Google Drive. So we've, we've gone in and we've marked up like this is heading one. You can see there, uh, this is heading one. So let's say we wanted to make all of our heading ones italics. Uh, so the way that I would do that is to go over here to Appearance and do custom CSS now of course I could just switch to a whole different theme and it would do this automatically uh, but let's just say I wanted to do it manually I open up this CSS which is called a cascading style sheet and what this lets me do is is uh, put in a little code in so that it sort of preempts the default uh, so I go h1 is the heading one tag for CSS and then you can change everything from color to style you know whatever you could think of to change you could do that here uh, I just put font style italic you can see the formatting here again I'm not going to go into detail here <laughs> just showing you how it works in principle but save that and what this you can see what it'll do now all of my headings are now italics so instead of having to go in manually you know, make every each one of those things italics. I just do it once on the style sheet, and it does it for everything. So that's the principle. So let me go back really quickly to the uh, post I was working on. Uh, and then in Microsoft Word, it's again even easier. I'll bring up Word so you can look at that. It's the same principle in uh, Google Docs as well. Let me just show you the window I'm working with Let's try that one more time all right get you over here make it bigger okay hopefully you can see this uh, so same principle we've got introduction body let's say these were the sections we wanted we highlight it and up here under styles you can see there's heading one let's make this a heading two just so you can sort of get an idea for this what this looks like like that one body three let's just make those all heading number two so we've got a heading number one there and these are heading number two 
<laughs> okay, so what we can do in Word is right click on there where it says heading and you see we can modify it. So there's a couple different ways to work here. Let's just say you didn't want it blue, you wanted it to be green. Okay, maybe you want it to be a little bit bigger than that. Let's go ahead and bounce it up. Let's say you want to make it bold. Okay, we're really going all out. <laughs> Let's go ahead and make a couple of those just so you can really see that what is going to happen. Okay, we'll make those introduction or heading number one too. Okay, so you can see now, yeah, this one looks the way I want it, but now I got all these other heading number ones in there. I don't want to have to go through manually and, and do each one of those. So I can just click on this guy and say update heading one to match selection, or I can select all. Let's just do that. Boom. So it goes through automatically. Everything I've tagged as the heading number one is done and done. A lot easier than trying to manually <laughs> go through all this. <laughs> uh, okay, so she says it's useful, again, because uh, you don't want somebody to have to sit there and listen to the entire document when they just want to hear what's in a particular section. Uh, if you don't have section headings, it's very hard to do that. Uh, so that that's a... One good uh, benefit to you, uh, or benefit for them, but the benefit for you is it gets you to be gets you thinking about your overall structure, uh, gets you thinking about how you might want to organize this document, plan, revise it. So it, it's a it's a win win. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, she talks here about creating a script. You know, and this is something I kind of go back and forth with. You know, I've you know taught a lot of classes online, as you could imagine, and every now and then I'll. Uh, get a request to for, for me to uh, write everything down that I'm going to say and, and you know <laughs> provide that. Uh, the problem is, of course, I don't write down. I don't have a script uh, for these lectures. I just come up with it. You know, I have my PowerPoint, my notes. I <laughs> just kind of come up with it on the spot. <laughs> if I had, uh, you know, world enough in time, you know, I'd be happy to, to provide that. Uh, it's just difficult. But you know, I think uh, Donegan would get on me a little bit for this and say, well, you really should still uh, provide the script. It would uh, probably be more beneficial. I don't de deny it. You know, I think it probably would be more beneficial. Uh, I like to listen to the Great Courses Plus. You know, I like watching TED Talks and all of those. And, of course, those are very heavily scripted. <laughs> you know, everything is memorized uh, or read off a teleprompter in the case of Great Courses Plus. And if it's, a, you know, halfway decent, presenter you don't know that it doesn't sound like they're just reading off a script uh, just because it's off a script doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be in a monotone you know look at any hollywood movie <laughs> there's a script uh, but they just know how to read well how to act you know how to communicate orally in a way that it it's a uh, better uh you know and obviously if you have a script going into it you have fewer moments of you have fewer brain farts you won't be <laughs> going off topic all the time uh, it makes you kind of think about what you're going to say. So there's probably more benefits. Really, the only thing that's not beneficial, arguably, uh, is that it would take more time to prepare this. And then you would also, um, uh, well, some of the other arguments that she gives pretty good refutations for us. So <laughs> I'll get into those. <laughs> you know, the idea, I guess, one of the things I hear sometimes going to presenting at a, academic conferences is that it's really boring to sit there and listen to somebody just read a paper. You know, I, I tend to think, yeah, well, I could have just stayed home and, and read the paper. You know, why am I here? <laughs> listen, I'd rather read a paper myself than hear it read to me, you know, especially this sort of dense academic prose. Uh, so there is, you know, some arguments people make along those lines. Uh, but I think she's probably right. You know, my one of my best professors in Ph.D. school, he, he always recommended that you write a script. Uh, but he did specify that the script that you have for reading out loud to an audience should not be your paper. He's quite adamant about this. You know, the paper, something that you're meant to sit down and read carefully, you know, that could be a lot more complicated and very dense and very long. Uh, but if you're meant to be just listening to this and taking it in uh, orally, uh, you should simplify your, your structures and not try to cram so much in. <laughs> You know, and not try to read so quickly. You know, there's 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 an art basically to writing a good script uh, for any kind of presentation. Uh, she gives a few tips on this. Uh, the notes section of a PowerPoint. Uh, Google Docs has a similar thing. Let me just get that up real quick so you can see what that looks like. 
Okay. Bounce over to PowerPoint. All right, so here's PowerPoint, and again, it's very similar to Google Slides. Uh, but this section here called Notes, I can just open this up, type, you know, whatever it is I want to say there in the notes, and I'm good to go. You know, and if you're the type of person, too, that if you get a little bit nervous about a presentation, if you're a little bit nervous about presenting to a, to a group, you know, again, having a good script might be the way to go. Because you know, that way you don't have to sit there and try to remember, like, what was I going to say? Oh, my God. You know, even having detailed notes sometimes doesn't quite cut it. Uh, so you know, I think she's definitely on to something here. I, I'm really, <laughs> you know, maybe just uh, to test it out, maybe I'll do the next lecture. Maybe I'll have a script for that. And you'll see how that goes. Uh, but her argument is it's, again, a win-win, better for the, uh, the listeners, whether or not they can read, uh, or whether they, they, not they can see it or hear it or not. You know, it's just good. It makes a better finished product uh, because you are having to put more thought into uh, uh, the structure of that. Yeah, there she is at the end. I know some people feel a bit guilty or discouraged when they learn about accessibility for the first time. You know, I certainly put myself in that camp. Uh, you know, you just take so much for granted. It's not its not that you, uh, you know, are trying to be a bad person or anything. I mean, obviously not. But uh, you just haven't really thought about this stuff before. Uh, so the I like the way she quotes uh, Maya Angelou here. You know, so don't, you know, beat yourself up about it. You know, just think, okay, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. Right? So now that you know about alt text and making these section headings and <laughs> writing scripts, <laughs> You know, this will be a win-win, uh, not, uh, you know, I don't want to emphasize the win for you too much here because, you know, we do want to keep in mind the more uh, ethical dimensions of this. But uh, it isn't just a, a one-way uh, path here, I think, is the message. Yeah, this stuff will make your writing even more powerful. Okay, so I'm out of time here, so we'll stop it. Uh, but again, if you have questions, comments, uh, some experience uh, with these things, I'd love to hear of them. Uh, but I'll stop it here and see you next time.